your uh, assistant coaches describe you as a master motivator, and you like to talk about having an angry football team a lot coming off a national championship. How do you get an angry football team? How do you motivate your guys the way you want to? I think uh, that's, a, that's a great question. That's one that uh, is not an easy answer. That's one that um, we don't have to do that this time of year. We just have to improve. And I think I had a good conversation with Lou Holtz the other day. And, and uh, this is an interesting uh, comment, and, and I shared it with our staff, that the morale of a team, the morale of a locker room is not just because you win. It's because they know they're getting better. So right now it's not – we're not into the motivation, and it's just about improving. And as long as a player or, you know, the program feels like it's getting better, the motivation is going to be there. It's going to be great. We're not trying to win a game yet. So that's a great question, though. That hasn't – we're not crossing that bridge at this time. But that's, that's going to be the essence of 2015, what you just said is how do you somehow create that uh, uh, with your leadership on your team? How do you create that? Because a complacent, entitled team is going to be really, really bad. Uh, a team that somehow has a little chip on their shoulder like this team did uh, well, is going to be the essence to our season. Great question. It's just this time you don't have to do that. You're just trying to make sure the morale, and once again, how do you have a good morale on a team or within each unit? If the linebackers jog off the field today, you know they're getting a little better and a chance to be really good because their coach coaches them and they're in a good program and they're getting stronger, great morale. If they think they're uh, uh, flatlined, you're going to see some bad things happen in a unit. Front row, Bill. Could you kind of address the quarterback situation? Obviously, you have two guys who are going to be very limited. Braxton are very, very limited. Um, how do you foresee that playing out in spring and then in the future? Uh, the, each player, each day is, you know, separate. So our day today was all about uh, Braxton continuing to, on Alana's journey to get healthy, which he's done an excellent job. Uh, he goes down to Birmingham. He's been down there at least twice, I want to say maybe three times, to, to work with them and to make sure that the rehab is going uh, on point. Our trainers and doctors have done a really good job. But it's all Braxton. You know, the longer I'm in this profession, it's the, the doctors and trainers do it, but the kid knows. And I ask him every day, how's it going? And, and he's a man enough to tell me if it's, you know, how's the rehab going? Uh, so, uh, and obviously, uh, JT is a guy that has a leg injury. He was doing a little bit more than I thought he could. So he went through seven on, uh, I know he did mini field. I'm not sure he did seven on seven. But we want to keep pushing him and get him healthy. And then Cardell's getting more reps he's ever gotten. And, you know, he's like the last three games. So it's day to day. And, and uh, when you say, how does it play out, I don't. I don't know. I mean, we're going to worry about Braxton getting to Thursday and get something out of him in practice. I know he did some running. So it's day-to-day, -day, uh, player by player. And that's the focus, not what's going to happen and what, what we foresee. Fred Rowe, Austin? To follow up on that, Urban, is it, is it unique, the situation that you're in, that you couldn't say one guy is at the top of the depth chart because they're not all going to be full Probably, up? yeah. Uh, I think it's unique at that position. I've never had it like that. I've had it at the other positions where all of a sudden you have three or four really good receivers, but you play more than one at a time. So I think it is fairly unique. I don't, I've don't. i never been in this situation. You know, I was close one year with Tim Tebow and Chris Leak where they were both very good, very good players. Um, and if I remember, the backup might have been Cam Newton. So I guess we were kind of in that situation. I've never thought about it. Is there any significance to you to seeing Braxton out there going through Warm -ups. I just love seeing it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, first of all, it's just the the relationship part of me that I love Braxton Miller. I, I always have, and he's a he's always done what I asked him to do, and uh, he's a selfless guy that works really hard. So, is there part of me that's excited to see that guy out there warm up and run through his drills and see that great attitude and a good smile on his face? Absolutely. Front row, Todd. Aaron, you were so big last year, maybe the last couple of years on the power of the unit and some of those unit leaders with the coaches have changed. How does that change the dynamic of those meeting rooms, quarterback room, running back room? Well, we just went to through uh, two workshops in the last uh, two weeks on uh, our factor training and that's how to respond to events and uh, every coach that's been here in the past sat through it and the new guys got the initial reaction or initial sting of it and then uh, brotherhood of trust. So we're continuing on at some point. We'll hit that with the team as well. Uh, but and that was part of the interview process or conversation process when we hire people. And I think people know now that we're bringing them in to learn our culture and to add to it, not to, we're not changing things. And so uh, that's, those are good questions. That's uh, something I'm going to watch like a hawk, that the culture here is established. Now we have to just add to it, not change it. Front row left, Rob. 
been out of your travels the last two months. How has the perception of this program changed from where you were three years ago nationally? Do you get a feel just of yeah, I think they're right. You know, just uh, they're saying you're faster, faster, faster. I, I think there's been such great respect for what Ohio State's done. I don't hear, boy, because it's not like it was a mess. We had one tough year, and you know, a couple circumstances uh, take place. But if you really knew what happened, there, there was not, there was nothing evil about Ohio State. There was uh, great things that happened, a couple mistakes made, and and what you, if you really lift the hood and say what really happened, honestly, it was really all good. A couple of mistakes or terrible mistakes were made, but it was not with intent. And so I think everybody understands that. The further removed we get from that, and I think the initial sting of what happened is over. And boy, Ohio State's back to being Ohio State. And, and uh, so I, I just uh, that I don't feel at all. I feel the you know people you know I was even telling our team perception of the Big Ten to Ohio you can't run that that's blown away. I mean because we can run pretty good. Now we got to keep that going because some of those guys that could run. Are going to run a pro day here in a couple of days. Is it fair? I mean, the, the SEC of the North, is that a fair thing? Is that, or is that an insult? What is it? I don't know. I'm just real Ohio State Buckeyes and play pretty good ball. That's all I know. Front row left, Rusty. Yeah, yeah Urban, what, uh, what's the condition on several of the other injured guys? I mean, Ezekiel with his hand. Don Trey's out. You know, he's, uh, he's doing his, uh, he's gained weight. I don't know if you could tell when you saw him out there. He's thicker. You know, uh, Zeke Elliott, we're being very cautious with him. His whole thing is he can't fall, you know, and so we're being very cautious with him. Uh, we, ca we call it the 2,000 rep club, too. You know, once you have 2,000, we rechart everything around here. And, and our strength coach is over the top about, you know, you know these, are, these are growing people that, you know, the, the young Mike Hills of the world needs so many reps. That like last year's Darren Lee did, but once you start hitting the 2,000 reps, 2,000 means that's a lot of these kids played 1,400 reps last year. You do that by two years, Pat Elf, the Pat Elf lines, the Taylor Deckers, you got to be really smart and efficient, but then you also got to develop chemistry. So, so that's kind of what spring ball is going to look like. It might look kind of ugly and nasty out there at times because guys are out there that shouldn't be out there yet, but that's part of spring practice. That's why I hate spring games. I mean, Try to take the pressure out the spring game by putting fast and student or something like that, which we'll do all that kind of silly stuff too, to take the pressure off the game. Do you have to be particularly which is going to be awful, by the way. <laughs> do you have to be particularly aware of how anybody having a sense of entitlement or accomplishment? Do we have to be aware? Well, particularly yeah. aware. Now. Yeah, we're human beings, man. That's uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think last year we had that sense of around here at all, and this year I'm watching it and I don't feel it. I mean. If I do, it's uh, we dive right into it. There's not a not a whole lot of whispering. We dive right into it and find out what the problem is. But that is uh, these are all good questions. That's uh, that's something we're watching very closely. Back row left, Marty. Coach, good morning. Uh, most people might presume that it's a luxury to have all that talent at quarterback, but what level of stress is there to have to make a decision like that with all that talent? None for me. You know, I think uh, at some point there'll be some. Because of the respect I have for those three guys, and you know, it's a position you can't. You know, there's ways of putting two tight ends on the field. There's ways to put four receivers on the field. There's even a way to put three safeties on the field. So I'll put one in nickel. Um, so it's it's more for me. It's there's no stress at all as far as the functionality of the position. It's the personalities, families, people involved. If I disliked one or two of them, it'd be not that hard. But I have a lot of respect for those guys, and and everybody around here has seen what they've done. So that, that's the only dilemma that I can see happening. It's not right now because we're not even focused on that. I want to see five get healthy and, and JT get healthy and Cardell continue to improve. Far left, Matt. Um, dovetailing off of that with Cardell, what do you want to see from him this spring, being that out of those three, he's the one that's healthy? Well, he that. became a, a very functional player with repetition. You know, he was not, uh, he was in, you know, Last spring, he had a decent spring with reps. And then uh, in the fall, he was OK. But then uh, when he took over for the Alabama game, he had a lot of reps getting ready. And he played very well when he had a month, because he had a month to get ready for that thing. And then he had a week to get ready for the championship game. And he played very well. So he, he's still raw. He's still very you know, almost a rookie that's an older rookie that hasn't had a lot of reps. And that's what we're seeing is I want to see him get a million reps this spring. Um, Position-wise, is there any? particular position battle or whatever that you're going into this spring looking at, we need to settle this or not necessarily settle because you have a pole camp too, but that you 
Yeah, I think the de defensive much. line, you know, I'm very disappointed in the young defensive linemen we brought in here. You know, not with what kind of people they are, just the performance. And so you got Jalen Holmes, you got Sam Hubbard, who almost pulled his red shirt last year because he came on so hard. So that's a position to really watch. And Taekwon Lewis. Um, and then your interior guys, you know, Mike Hill, Donovan Munger, Tommy Shutt, very disappointed. Once again, not who they are, uh, but, you know, you, you have to play. Or, you know, if, if Mike Bennett leaves and you're not as good as Mike Bennett, our team's not as good. So that's those are two areas that uh, one, two positions that I'm watching really closely that have to get better. Front row left, Doug. Urban, you've gone through this twice before as a head coach where you won a national title and then come back and deal with that. How did you feel like in this little time since signing day? Do you feel any different than you did with the two you won at Florida? Is there anything that you learned from going through that for your team or for you personally coming off of it? Yeah. I think the biggest issue is, you know, that when you have staff, every time you have staff transition, and then you worry about, you know, you worry about, number one, you worry about just complacency in a program, and then you worry about, um, you know, you lose a Stan Drayton, who was a heck of a football coach, and he goes and moves on, which he has every right to do, and we wish him well, because I love Stan. Uh, but you just worry, will there be a drop-off in that room? That's, that's what, and I was worried about that at other places. And I'm going to watch it even more closely now than I ever have. Uh, but every year, every year is different. Every team's different. Uh, so to say that was this year different than 08 or 06, I, I haven't even really thought about that. I'm just worried about this team because I, I know what, I'm using more of what it was like last year, as opposed to what it was five, six, seven, even nine years ago. And and you know you're saying you're excited to see Braxton out there, and we know he has you know what he can do at quarterback. Have you ever? had any conversation or any thought with Braxton about playing something other than quarterback here? No, it's so much of it. All our conversations are about health of the athlete, and that's it. And, um, you know, I, I just want to see him get healthy. But, no, to sit there and start saying, you know, how about safety or corner or, or H-back or receiver, no, we haven't had that conversation. If he needed to do it, you think he could do it? If, he needed, if, if his shoulder just wouldn't let him be a quarterback, could he do it? Oh, I think he can do whatever he, he's athletic enough to, but I, I still think he's a quarterback. And final question, front row, Tim. Yeah, Irvin, going back to uh, just dovetailing off of a question earlier with Beck and uh, Tony Alford, uh, it, is there a long time spent on like language, et cetera? How do you, how do you sort of like move them into the program, so to speak? Well, we have a coach's manual that we kind of went through. Um, in pretty details, got ready for spring practice because yes, there is Tim to answer your question. There's a very detailed way we teach uh, the expectation level of your unit room, uh, the culture of the program. There's three parts of the culture that you're expected to know, the core values. So yeah, that's I'd have to say that's one area that I'm insane about, and that's just learning from the great organizations, the, from the Patriots, uh, where I spent a lot of time studying. Is that that's, everybody learns the Patriot way of doing it. And there's really not much negotiation or conversation. Now, everyone has a chance to enhance it. And I hired guys. You look at what uh, Nebraska, the last 10 years now, that's one of the winningest programs in America. So certainly did we try to, I also picked their brains about some of the things they did well. And then Tony Alfred came from one of the great programs. They played for a title two years ago. So I try to absorb or pull information out of them. But how does that fit into our culture? Do you feel at this moment, do you feel more comfortable than maybe you did in 2010, nine when you were replacing some guys? Do you feel, because this is like Yeah, I do, I, especially on defense, yeah. especially on defense. I feel right now, you know, our, our defensive coaches, um, you know, they actually led a team meeting today, Chris Ash and uh, uh, Luke Fickle, and it's magical. You know, and it was, you have meetings, this is really cool, you have meetings that are reactive and proactive. Reactive meetings are awful. We had one again after the Indiana game three years ago or whatever it was. Everybody remembers that meeting. That was not that was a very unpleasant meeting. It's called a reactive meeting. The meeting we had today was a proactive. We I think led the nation in missed tackles, fewest missed tackles this year. Uh, we also were very good at the something that we worked so hard is called the difference as far as hand placement and disengaging blocks. And our coaches came in and uh, uh, re, uh, proactive meetings. There's nothing better. A reactive meeting. I'm not sure there's anything worse. And so I want to make sure we enjoy the moment of our coaches getting up and, and feeling good about what they're teaching because it's really good. And uh, so 
Uh, to answer your question, I feel much better because they're all proactive meetings right now. We've had a plenty reactive around here, and that's not pleasant. One other thing, you all have two practices, then you have a spring break, and then you come back and have a <clears throat> What is the benefit of that now that you've been through it? Uh, we get 20-hour work week. So the NCA rule says that once you start practice, you get 20 hours to meet with them. So we're getting all the meetings and all that because there's so much stuff to run a practice. The snap count, the cadence, all the stuff that you have to do. And that gives us 20 hours this week. And then by the time we get back, we're cooking. And we started that, about, I think, when I came here. We used to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. And you just don't have time to teach the stuff, that, just the basics of football that a lot of them don't know. Now we get that 20-hour work week. That's the number one reason we do it. Well, I'm going to say, do you have to watch practice? This last one? Yeah. Last question. Do you have to, you know, his dad even brought this up a little bit. Maybe he got a little bit anxious, you know, at the end of the summer last year. We're watching Who knows what close. caused it. But do you really have to be cautious and make sure he's cautious about not pushing it? I talk to him every day about that, and that's why I'm, I'm not qualified to talk to him about it. That's why we send him down to Birmingham. And, and he, he's more mature, too. So whatever happened, you know, that's one thing about med medical issues you don't know. I mean, that's certainly I don't know. I have opinions, but that's what they exactly are. So we're watching that very, that's, that's, we're watching that very closely.